Mr. Odia, it's good to have you on the other news, sir. Now, on in your intro, I've never heard that word before, a polemist. Please, sir, who or what is a polemist? I've never called myself one. That's what they call you on Wikipedia, sir. People have every reason to use the knowledge they have of me mm. to describe me. Mm. But the knowledge I have of, my, of, of myself does not allow me to call myself a polemicist. Okay. But then, just for educational purposes, someone who calls himself that, not you now. What Somebody who is capable of being a, contra a, contrari a, a contrarian in the sense that you, you can disagree and defend your positions correctly. Okay. That means everybody in Nigeria is, uh, if you go to Bia Palo, they're always arguing and defending their positions, correct? No, except that there's a consistency to your practice which allows people to call you a polemicist. Oh, oh, wow. Because if you engage in polemics, it means you are capable of holding your audience at a certain range of expressiveness. Oh, wow. Okay, that's definitely a notch higher than Bia Palo. Yeah, very correct. <laughs> now, um, but then you are a poet. I'm a poet. I've, I've always wanted to be a poet. From the age of 12, I've written poetry. And from the age of 17, I started writing the kind of poetry that they now do in their school certificates. Wow. OK, so then let's talk about, uh, <laughs> thank you. So let's talk about poetry as an industry. What, in your opinion or in your perspective, is the future of that as an industry, poets doing well, like musicians, like actors, stuff like that? No, it is, it is very difficult to see poetry as an industry, but it remains one. And I tell you why I say it is difficult to see poetry as an industry. It does not provide the kind of monetary benefits mm. that you may derive from music, for instance. Unless you win the Nobel Prize or one of those big prizes, you are not likely to be a, to be putting plenty of food on the table by writing poetry. Mm. But you see, these days, there are so many prizes on board that poets are able to get the kind of money that you don't get in very many industries. Mm. Properly speaking, I can tell you don't buy poetry. <laughs> <laughs> now, in, in, in most communities, mm. where people do not buy books, you know that poetry will be downgraded. And to a very large extent, the downgrading of poetry is part of the reason we are not good in almost every other area. Because to be a poet re requires some level of creativity. You are bringing something new into every situation. In terms of arguments, in terms of the language you use, because a poet's job is to develop the language of everyday society so that we move as close as possible to music when we speak to one another. We, mm. we learn to entertain one another the way we speak. And if a poet manages to do it well, it genuinely develops a community. Mm. Wow. That you worked as a private secretary to great chief Obafemi Awolowo. I did. So what was it like? working closely with such an enigma? I was 28 when I started working as his private secretary. And it lasted for three years and 10 months. Perhaps the best three years and 10 months of my life in terms of the experience I acquired. Mm. Working with Awolowo, I tried to explain by zeroing on how I was employed. Before I became his private secretary, I had read all his books. I had a lot of respect for him. And where I disagreed with him, I could tell. And when, when it was advertised that he needed private secretaries who would be committed, I simply, although I was late in applying, I simply wrote that if by involved and committed, he did not imply that I would, I, I, I cannot disagree with my employer when I feel strongly about a problem. I will work for him. When you give your own employer a condition for working for him, and he ag agrees that you could work for him, it means he's a sensible man and a man who is serious. <laughs> so we're still conversing with the legendary Odia of Femu right here on the other news. Don't move anywhere. We'll be back before you say Femu. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, yes. It's still the other news, no contest. We're having a wonderful time here, and we're actually learning. Now, sir, we just came out of a presidential election. Over 10. How do you rate it? Are you serious? It's a question. <laughs> it's a question, sir. There was, was no election. Huh? Properly speaking, there was none. How do you mean, sir? If I gave them two over 10, I'll be doing the system a favor. Okay, so by, by what standard? I mean, people went out. At every stage of the electoral process, there was something fundamentally wrong. Which we've was? Not, we have not had an election. Just put it this way, since 1999, we've not had one proper election. They've all been very unfree and very unfair election. I mean, we are good people. Nigerians are not bad people at all. Our leaders are evil. The truth is that when you've had the kind of elections we've had in Nigeria, the proper thing would be to say, let's stop these elections and rejig the system. But we are af afraid to stop the elections to rejig the system because you can't be too sure that what will come after you've canceled one election will not be worse than the one you've just canceled. Mm -hmm. So we go on, we go on tripping from one. Fry pan to fire. This one is worse than being entering fire. It's full hair fire. It's worse than hellfire. <laughs> because, because properly speaking, I mean, I'm not trying to, to make people lose their, their cool about the election. Mm. If you take from 1999, just take one election of, uh, after the other, the, the, the next one will be worse than the last. If you run a country on that basis, it is not possible for a government that comes to power through a bad election to run a good system. Government. It is simply not possible. Okay, so now what exactly is the problem? Is it the process or the participants, in this case being the politicians? Just put it this way. A country that cannot count its population cannot have a proper register of voters. It is simply not possible. Yeah. And, then, and then we move, we move from not having a proper register of voters to having results that have no relationship to actual voting. And this has been happening since 1999? In every election. <laughs> now, look, it's, we can laugh about it, yes. but it is one of the most fundamental things in a democracy that people ought genuinely to be able to determine who we govern them. We don't have an elite that governs. We have an elite that exploits. So what is the solution, sir? The solution... What can we do? Okay, it, since the process and the participants are a problem, what about the people? Let me ask you. Since now you are old enough to have been a member of a political party 10 years over, have you ever paid party dues? Have you ever put one naira or ten naira in the coffers of a political party? If we do not fund our political parties, they will be funded by money bags who will determine who can run or who cannot run and who can win or who cannot win. Now, don't let people treat you like a youngster. Once you are 18, you are old enough to go to, you ought to be old enough to go to parliament. And if you can't go to parliament, to the state assembly, you should be old enough to go to a local government council where you can determine how water comes to your people, how boreholes are done when they cannot do proper water systems, and things of that nature. Now, if you are 18 and you are genuinely interested in politics and you can bring together a lot of like-minded people like yourself, you can almost determine what happens in your, in your area. Instead of being a tog, you should be a thinker for, the, for your area. Mm. Tog, but... Mr. Audio of Famous, thank you so much for thank talking to us. Thank you so much for talking to us. Once again, Mr. Audio of Famous, ladies and gentlemen.